Welcome to KCF's online church service. We're glad you've joined us. Please remember to like and subscribe. Celebrating their birthdays this week. On the 21st, Annie Reddy and Najib Majorti. On the 20th, Elizabeth Sweetland and Ileana Rangasamy. On the 19th, Momo Mokwena and Camilla Jose. On the 18th, Jordan Pele, Mbali Ngobane, Glindo Gutle Ngobane, Kenneth Leo, Yasmin McDonald, Gordon Gavinder, and Kimberly January. On the 17th, Angel Mbalane. And celebrating their anniversary this week, on the 18th, is Cyril and Jenny Saurimutu. Prayer and fasting will be held from tomorrow, the 17th of August, to the 23rd of August. A very good morning to you, KCF Church and all our online viewers. Greetings in Jesus' name. We want you to know that we are praying for you and we are waiting till we can meet again in person. And hopefully it's going to be soon. So having said that, I want to just make an announcement that on the 6th of September, the first week of September, we will be going into two services. And so we want to invite anybody and everybody that is healthy and well and would like to come and attend our services, take note that our first service will be at 8, from 8 to 9.30, and the second service will be from 10 to 11.30. So we look forward to seeing you again. We look forward to you coming and just fellowshipping with us. You know, I know that there is so much going on in our lives, in our nation, and in the world. And right now, maybe on top of the pandemic, uh, you are facing a loss of income, loss of job, uh, maybe the bills are piling up. Maybe you're going through some marital problems or maybe you're facing evic eviction or maybe you have health issues, relational issues. You may be facing mental health or problems like anxiety or depression or you may even have suicidal thoughts. We want you to know that we are there for you. And I know that there is a need for people to connect. There is a great need for people to come and receive counsel and be prayed for. And so we really want to encourage you, whatever your situation, we want to encourage you to, to, to come and speak to one of our pastors, uh, one of our leaders. We are available to help you. Amen. Uh, we're also providing grocery parcels for, for those that are still in need. And we want to encourage you, if you are, uh, are in need and you are not receiving a grocery parcel, please contact your cell leader or speak to your um, as area leader or your pastor and we'll try do our best to see how we can help you. Amen. I know it's very overwhelming, you know, uh, it's a very overwhelming time that we are facing and, you know, the Bible tells us that during these difficult times is when people seek God and uh, have an experience with God. And, and I want to encourage you that, you know, seek God with all your heart and, and trust Him for breakthroughs. Trust, trust Him for revival. Trust Him that He will come through for you. Amen. I think that there is no better time. Uh, than this to go into a spiritual time of fasting and prayer. And so as uh, for those of you who are paying attention to our year planner, we, uh, you, we would know that as of tomorrow, the 17th of August, we'll be on a fast um, for, for seven days till the 23rd of August. And I trust that you will join us and believe with us for, for, for God to meet your needs and for God to come through for you. Amen. So uh, we, we want to uh, just encourage you to WhatsApp us your prayer requests or send us an email or just phone us and let us know what, what we can pray for you. For the next seven days, we are going to pray for, 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 for breakthrough, pray for the country, pray for the sick, pray for all kinds of things. Amen. So um, uh, the, the, the other thing I want to say is just to say thank you. A big thank you to all our faithful tithers and to those who support the COVID fund. You know, in the book of Luke, chapter 6 and verse 38, it says this. It says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And I pray that in Jesus' name. And I trust God that you will be blessed in abundance as you sow and you give. Amen. I also want to just remind us that this month is our missions month, our annual missions month. And I want you to pray about, you know, trusting God to give by faith 
to the missions program of our church, which we use to support uh, the, the, the missionaries. Every week we'll be playing a clip of those we support and uh, on a monthly basis. Um, we also, uh, you know, I, 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 when I think about the missionaries that we've been supporting, you know, I understand why we are so blessed as a church and as a congregation. Because for 17 years, we've been tithing. For 17 years, we've been supporting missions. Amen. And so, so, so God has blessed us. And so today, we have um, Dr. Louis Baum from Judea Harvest is going to share what's happening at Judea. And also, we've got uh, Pastor Edel Naidu from Family Policy Institute. And he's going to share with us what's happening in that part of the ministry. So let's get ready to watch that and I'll come back later to share the word with you. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you in a while. Many people think that the Church of Christ has many jobs to do of which one is missions. That is not correct. The church does not have a job to do Christ's mission. The church is Christ's mission to this whole world. And what a joy it is for me today to just share with Pastor Morgan and the KCF Church Group family that for many, for more than one decade, uh, we as Judea Harvest, Judea Hope, Judea Training have been partnering with KCF Church and we've done many, many missions together. Some of them, Pastor Morgan joined us to India, some to the rural tent church planting, some we do just because you give. So I want to thank the family of KCF every time you give some money to missions. To, to fulfill the great commandment of Christ and the great commission of Christ. You empower us as part of your mission, budget and plan to do Christ's mission. And on your behalf, we are your foot soldiers right throughout Africa, planted 10,000 churches, Southern Africa, 7,000 in Muslim North and West Africa. We thank you for partnering with us. We thank every member that give faithfully every month or annually towards your mission budget. And may God bless you during this mission month. And may God be with you as we journey in the mission for Christ to win this world for him. How do you get a continent saved? The way that Judea Harvest does it is we recruit a person who already has an anointing, who already receives the calling from God and says, I want to go. We take that guy, we guide him, we train him, we mentor him and we mobilize him to do evangelism and church planting. On this journey, he plants a house church and we are with him with resources like the Bible, like the audio Bible, like the solar power teaching towers to equip him to do the job perfectly and good. And when he has established the church, we come along and we help him to build a physical building to anchor that church in the community. When that is done, Judea Harvest comes. We recruit new people who says, me too, I want to do something for God. I want to plant churches. And then we train them, we resource them, we mobilize them. And in this way, the church of God grows organically in Africa. And in the words of Reinhard Bonke, we know Africa will be saved. Hi everyone, I'm Pastor Moes Baloi. So Teaching Tower, uh, it, help, it helps us a lot for many, for many Bible college, Bible teaching that we're having. And then we were making a small group like a home cells in different areas and then they gather together and then we teach them uh, all the topics that it, we have here in the Bible, uh, 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 for Bible, mini Bible uh, teaching. So from there we saw a growth from the Christians because a lot of things that they were learning, they were new. And then we saw the church also going, uh, growing in the big number because of the effective of the teaching that we have uh, in the uh, mini Bible teaching. So now we have got a teaching tower uh, that is connected with a Wi-Fi, which means 
a person can able to connect from 150 meters away. It's very, very effective uh, to the community because everyone can connect from home. And then we saw people getting saved uh, each and every Sunday. They give their life to Jesus because of the amazing teaching that we have from Teaching Tower. So we thank Judea for what for the great work that they are doing. I think it will be very, very effective to all the community, different community. So we'll keep and uh, praying for you guys to, to for doing and helping us with these amazing resources. Thank you. May God bless you. Hi, I'm Inusak Badamasi. I'm the regional coordinator of Judea Harvest in West Africa. I'm also the founder and director of uh, uh, a leadership training center named Centre de Formation des Leaders. Uh, we begin the training center since 2007, but uh, some years ago now, I'm in partnership with Judea Harvest to build uh, a good, well-equipped uh, training center that will cover all the West Africa and also some French-speaking countries. So we are far in the structure. The structure is already on plus. Uh, what we need now is to uh, help uh, to make uh, all the sanitaries, the dormitories, and so, so that uh, in uh, April or May, I think we can begin. Yes, I just want to thank the donors, those who help us to build this training center. May God bless you. Amen. My name is James. I'm from Asoy. I'm holding this MBC unit. It has a Bible and the Zulu version of the MBC. It feels like smuggling the Bible because we are on lockdown and we are making a plan to get the way to the people. So after this 21 year journey of doing God's harvesting work in Africa, all that is left now is to invite you to join us, to partner with us so that the continent of Africa can be transformed by the power of Greetings, Pastor Morgan and Valencia Pillay and Kensington Community Fellowship in Johannesburg. Firstly, Arlene and I would like to extend our deep gratitude and thanks to you for your prayers, your loyal financial support and your words of encouragement. Thank you for standing with us, especially through these difficult times. None of us would have believed that this year 2020 would be locked down that we would be in a global pandemic crisis and that businesses would have closed down, economic downturn and all the things that has happened over the past few months. But we take encouragement and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ that even though we go through trying times, God is with us. And this is what's happened to us at Family Policy Institute. Uh, the, uh, income and donations that de has declined uh, dramatically but we thank God for your loyal support that kept us going through this trying times. And I want to encourage you that even though so much has happened around us, God is still faithful. We, we can testify to that. We faced numerous challenges over this past few months in the lockdown, economic downturn, all kinds of things. But God has been faithful. He kept us going. And I know He's keeping you going. I'm, I'm so grateful for Pastor Morgan's regular calls and words of encouragement because those are the things that in times like this we value the most. Family Policy Institute celebrated 12 years of fighting for faith, family and freedom in South Africa on the 7th of July this year. 12 years of serving the Lord. And of those 12 years, Kensington Community Fellowship has been partnering with us for 11 years, so 11 out of the 12. And we are so grateful for your support, for your encouragement, and for your prayers. Keep going in the Lord, because Arlene and I and the team, we will. We keep our eyes on the Lord. We are not in fear, anxiety. We, are in, we walk in faith, we operate in faith, because we face formidable battles in this country. Attacks coming against the family, attacks coming against children, Attacks coming against our religious freedoms. But our faith is in the Lord. And we keep on fighting. We keep on creating public awareness. So we never tire. We keep on fighting. 
for faith, for family and religious freedoms. There are many attacks coming against the family, many attacks coming against our faith and our religious freedoms. But we don't tire in serving the Lord because He's called us and equipped us to do that. And our job is to in, um, inform, educate and equip the body of Christ so that the body of Christ can fulfill its biblical mandate to be salt and light in society. So Arlene and I and the team at Family Policy Institute want to thank you, Pastor Morgan and Valencia Pillay. We bless you and your family. We bless the church at Kensington Community Fellowship in Johannesburg and Solid Community Church uh, for your support because without your support, we cannot do what we do. So thank you and God bless you. Stay safe, wash your hands, or sanitize, and wear a face mask. Amen. Come on, do you believe that every race belongs to Him? Praise.
We thank you, Jesus. Amen. That every praise belongs to you. I worship you. you 
Amen. Let's get ready to listen to the Word of God this morning. Can I ask you to bow your heads with me as we just pray for the Word? Father, we say thank you for the Word that is going to go forth this morning. And to all those that will hear this morning, mighty God, I pray that they will re receive revelation, they will receive understanding, but most important of all, may they not only be hearers of your word, may they be doers also. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning I want to share with you um, about consecrating your heart. Consecrating your heart. Uh, my sermon is taken from, I'm going to start off from the book of Mark, chapter 7, and uh, share a few other scriptures with you as we just get to understand what it means to consecrate your heart. But as an introduction, um, what was happening in Mark, chapter 7, Jesus was ministering to all his disciples like he has been doing, but on this occasion, uh, some Pharisees, some religious leaders, teachers of the, of the law, made a long journey. Some of them would have traveled most probably 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers, and, and they would have done this by foot, you know. And they had come to hear Jesus speak. The reason for coming, though, was not so that they want to learn from him, but they wanted to come and find fault with him, to criticize him, to discredit him as a leader. So as they approach this place, they notice that his disciples are eating and they, they, they address Jesus and say, Jesus, you know, uh, how is it that your disciples um, uh, are eating without washing their hands? And, that they are, and, and they made the statement that they were unclean. Now, the Pharisees and scribes were religious leaders who um, had rules and uh, rituals that were made by men that the Jewish people had to follow. Here we find that they criticized Jesus because Jesus' disciples are not following those rules and those rituals. And as a rabbi, as a teacher, he was to be held responsible or accountable for his disciples' actions or for not teaching them to, 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 to wash their hands. Now, the issue is that it's not that they didn't wash their hands. It's that they didn't wash it, their hands in the way the religious leaders would wash their hands. So they had a way of washing their hands that you would have not only just wash your, your, your fingers, that you had to wash your, all the way to your elbow so that the water dripped and you had to repeat this process a few times. And that was the ritual of ceremonial washing that Jewish people had to do because of a number of reasons. And I don't want to get into that this morning. So, so, so Jesus uh, bluntly called them hypocrites and he quoted um, the scripture uh, for them that is found in the book of Mark chapter 7 and verse 6. He says, these people, he's quoting uh, the prophet Isaiah, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far, far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. And then he goes on further to say a whole lot of things, you know, of, the, of these religious rules and rituals that they do. And then he, he says, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Mark chapter 7 and verses 14 and 15. So later on, as the, the crowds were dispersed, his disciples came to Jesus and asked him, what did he mean when he said to them that nothing outside a man can make him unclean, but only what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. And so the, from, that's where I want to pick up uh, this morning. And uh, it's found in uh, Mark chapter 7 and from verse 18. He says, are you so dull? He asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, 
deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and makes a man unclean. See, no amount of washing on the outside can remove the sin and the defilement on the inside. You know, as I was thinking and preparing this, I had this thought. Do you know that somebody can ask me that same question today? What are you talking about, you may say, Pastor? Well, somebody could come and say, well, your members have gotten into the, gotten into the habit for almost five months for wearing, of, for wearing masks, sanitizing and social distancing, but they don't obey your teaching. They are ready and willing and able to obey man's rules, but they have excuses when it comes to obeying God's commands. Well, some of you may disagree, some of you may agree, some of you may not know what to say. And so, if that is true, and you say, well, you know what, we do obey God's commands. Or let's say if it's true that you don't obey God's commands, make a decision today to say, you know what, we're going to do what God tells us to do, just like how we obey all these other rules given to us by the government. So, in the book of Second Chronicles, I want to just give you a little bit of a, an overview here as well. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, the Bible talks about Solomon who, you know, asks God for, God for wisdom and then God gives him wisdom and then he builds the temple and then he dedicates the temple to God and then he prays to God, you know, asking God for a whole a lot of blessings to fall upon the temple. And then here in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 12, God answers him. And it says in verse 12, The Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague, and now uh, the plague here, the synonym or another word for the plague is a pandemic, a infection, disease, outbreak. You know, that's, that, that, that's what we're talking about. And God's saying, um, uh, or, or, or send a plague among my people. And then he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal the land. Now, I don't want to get into a dis discussion in terms of, you know, this pandemic that we're facing, is it from God? Did God allow it? And all that stuff. But what I do want you to know that God says that if these things happen, if we who are His people will humble ourselves, if we will pray, if we will seek God, if we will turn from our wicked ways, then He will hear from heaven, He will forgive our sins, and He will heal our land. And so this is the message that God has given me. And this message comes from Exodus chapter 29 and verse 37. And this is the word for you to obey this morning, children of God. For seven days, make atonement for the altar and consecrate it. Then the altar will be most holy and whatever it touches will be holy. God is saying that we must purify the altar and consecrate it every day for seven days. After that, that altar will become absolutely holy and whatever touches it would become holy. Now, in the, in the, in the Old Testament, there were two uh, altars in the tabernacle of Moses. One was used for sacrifices and the other one was used for the burning of incense. And so, what I want to say to you today is that in the New Testament, God says that we are His temple. Amen. That's found in 1, Cor uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses uh, 16 and 17. He says, Do you not know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? So, so, so we are God's temple individually and we are God's temple corporately as believers. Amen. So our hearts then are therefore the altars. Hallelujah. And so God says, and my message to you is to consecrate our hearts, is to consecrate the altar. And God 
desires that every believer, every believer, it doesn't matter who they are, where they are, God's desire is that every believer will consecrate or dedicate their hearts to Him and make it holy. Consecrate means to make holy or to dedicate to a higher purpose. And why is consecration important? Because it's an act of, of, of a child of God's will. It's an act of the Christian's will to resolve in the hearts to fulfill God's plan and purpose for their lives. See, dedication is to set apart. And we must be, a, be, be dedicated and devoted to the things of God. The question is, what are you dedicated and what are you devoted to? And that's why God wants us to dedicate our hearts, to consecrate our lives, to make it holy, to put Him first, to follow His plan and His purpose, and to do what the Word of God says. You know, many of us are dedicated to many things. Some of us are dedicated to our jobs. We are devoted to our children. Uh, but how many of you are truly consecrated or dedicated to God and to Jesus Christ? It's a private commitment of the heart. See, coming to church doesn't mean that you are consecrated or dedicated to God. Many people come for various reasons. Amen. Some people come because their parents brought them. Some people come because their girlfriend brought them. Some people come because, you know, they have some kind of need. Some people come because, you know, like the Pharisees to see, well, let me see what happens. Or let me try and find some fault in, in what, the, what, what, what they are preaching this morning. So let me get to the point. How do we dedicate ourselves to God? There are two basic daily activities that show dedication to God. The first one is that we need to read His Word. And the second is that we need to pray. So for the next seven days, God wants us to do three things. Firstly, He wants us to read His Word. Secondly, He wants us to pray. And thirdly, that we must share communion. So we are going into this time of fasting and prayer. You know, prayer is a powerful weapon. You can bring back love, peace and joy in your home. You can change the circumstances of your life. You know, when we pray, we have the assurance that we will have the victory. We must pray to be set free. Pray to be set free from strongholds. Pray for strongholds to be broken. Pray for your finances. Pray for your job. Pray for your business. Pray for salvation. Pray for your family and friends. You know, we need to teach our sons and daughters to pray. Hallelujah. We need to take authority over our marriages. Take authority over your sickness. Hallelujah. Pray is a weapon. And when, when, when the enemy attacks us, we pray. We pray for our church. There is power in prayer. The Bible tells us in the book of James that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person availeth much. And it goes on to tell, Elijah was a man just like us. He was able to pray. And when he prayed for the, uh, for, for, for the rain to stop, the rain stopped. And when he prayed again for the rain to come, the rain come. We must have that same fervent prayer. And if we consecrate our hearts and we dedicate our hearts to God, and for seven days we consecrate this altar and we make it holy and we make it uh, clean again, I tell you something, we're going to see the altar. We're going to, our lives are going to become holy and whatever we touch will be holy and we're going to see the power being manifest and we're going to see answers and breakthrough in our homes, in our families, in our nation, in our community, in our church and we're going to see the sick people being healed. We're going to see, you know, finances come through. We're going to see breakthrough happen in our lives. Hallelujah. The Bible says we must pray continually. We must give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. This is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. So we need to return to the Lord and it starts by reading, by praying and sharing communion. We're going to do that for the next seven days, children of God. So get your hearts ready. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to give our, to give our spiritual hearts a thorough checkup. And else help us to consecrate our, 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 our hearts to God. Amen. And so, so, so we need to sort out the sin in our lives. There has to be this cleansing that's going to take place. Where we're going to be repenting before God and asking God to forgive us. And I tell you something, we're going to get into another dimension with God and another dimension in the power of the Holy Spirit. So once again, the scripture Exodus 29 and verse 37, it says, 
purified the altar and consecrated every day for seven days. After that, the altar will be absolutely holy and whatever touches it will become holy. We need you to reflect on Jesus these seven days. Engage with God in a process of removing those things from our hearts. You know, Jesus said, from the heart proceeds all this stuff, you know, this evil stuff. And we need to get rid of that and, and consecrate our hearts and make it holy again. So that, you know, what comes out of there is love, peace, joy, forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration, you know, uh, refreshing. That's what must come out of us. Amen. And, I, and, and, and we will receive a, a, a fresh anointing over our lives. Invite the Holy Spirit to come and fill you afresh. Amen. And the effects of a consecrated heart is that we will have a renewed heart. Our hearts will be changed. You know, we'll be more alive to the things of God. We'll, have, we'll be more powerful in our witness. We'll be more powerful in our ministry. We'll be more powerful in our prayers. Will you? Uh, dedicate your heart to this process would you will you consecrate your heart you know to God and make it holy for his glory and for his purpose hallelujah so I encourage you this morning each and every one of you all those who are listening fast with us pray with us these seven days uh, there, there, there's a number of ways we can fast. You can pray from six fast from six a.m. to six p.m. You can fast, you know, dry fast the whole day, or you can, you know, be on uh, on a vegetable diet the, the the whole day. And but whatever you do, the important thing is to read the word, to pray, and to share communion. And as you begin to do that, consecrate your heart. Get in this process of removing all that stuff that Jesus spoke about that defiles us so that we can be holy and that we can be powerful in what we say and what we do. Hallelujah. So I, I pray that you've been encouraged this morning that you're going to join us in prayer and fasting. And so to those that you know don't understand consecration and you have not saved, you haven't given your life to Jesus, uh, consecration is not the same as salvation. Salvation is a free gift that God offers us. Jesus invites you to accept this free gift because uh, he, he made atonement for our sins. He paid the price. He provided the sacrifice. He died for all our sins. And, and, and by his stripes we have been healed. Hallelujah. And so you choose uh, you know, to, to, to um, accept this free gift, you know, to that uh, free gift of salvation. And if you are that person this morning, I want to pray with you. And, and, you know, Jesus came into the world to save us from being eternally separated from God. He came to give us eternal life. And the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. I can receive this eternal life by confessing with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in my heart that Jesus Christ died on a cross for all my sins and that on the third day he arose from the dead and when I have done that I can ask the Holy Spirit to come and you will have this born again experience and your life will never be the same again. Amen. So let us pray this morning as we just commit ourselves make a commitment this morning that you're going to devote you're going to consecrate your heart to God and you're going to pray and fast with us as we just lead you in a prayer of repentance. So would you pray with me this morning? You say, Lord Jesus, I confess this morning that you are Lord of my life. And I believe that you died for my sins and on the third day you arose from the dead. And I thank you this morning that as I confess with my mouth that you are Lord and believe in my heart that you have you've been raised from the dead, I will be saved. And so I thank you for saving me this morning. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come and fill me this morning with a fresh anointing, a new anointing. And Lord, I commit this morning to uh, consecrate my heart for the next seven days. I will read your word. I will pray. I will share communion. And Father God, I will obey your word in Jesus' name. So may the Lord bless you, uh, children of God. And I just trust that 
the seven days are going to be a real life-changing experience for you. I pray that in Jesus' name. So for those of you who prepared communion this morning, I just want to encourage you, um, let us take the bread and, and, and just pass it around and give thanks for it. And then as we share communion this morning, hallelujah. So Father, I want to say thank you for this bread that reminds us of you dying on the cross for us and your body that was broken for us and we say thank you for this cup that reminds us that you paid for my sins with your precious blood and that even as we pray Lord that this bread and this cup Lord becomes your body and your blood and your body and your blood as the power to transform my life if you believe that by faith this morning trust God that as you do this for the next seven days, you're going to see great, phenomenal breakthroughs in your life. Hallelujah. So let's pray and eat and drink together. So Father, I say thank you for this bread and this cup. And I bless it. And Father God, all our congregation, wherever they may be, as they have this bread and cup, Lord God, Father, I pray that you bless it and may they experience miracles in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And may they receive a blessing this morning, wherever they are. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's eat, let's drink together. I trust that you've been blessed this morning. Once again, I trust this week is going to be a blessed week. Amen. God bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you this week and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today. For more videos and more content, please press the subscribe and like button. Have a blessed week.